Welcome everybody. So glad you guys could join us for another great Learn at Lunchtime. Um, we're going to be um, recording this program, but now I would like to turn over to our State Museums Program Director, Bradley Smith. Thank you, Sherry. And hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I am Bradley Smith, Program Director at the State Museum of Pennsylvania, and this is Curator's Choice, a program of our Learn at Lunchtime series. Today, we're pleased to introduce Dr. Kurt Miner as this week's Curator's Choice speaker. Kurt has been a curator with the State Museum since 1994. Hi, Kurt. And he has been, hey, our, he has been our senior history curator since 2011. His program today is entitled Fly Over Pennsylvania, T.M. Fowler's Bird's Eye Views of Pennsylvania. Kurt, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Brad. I'm looking forward to the presentation. I want to uh, uh, begin by talking about, uh, well, the, the program that led to this program, which was an exhibit um, we assembled uh, at the State Museum of Pennsylvania in the fall of 2017. Um, the exhibit was titled, Everything of Interest Shown, Bird's Eye Views of T.M. Fowler in Pennsylvania's, of Pennsylvania Cities and Towns. The original exhibit had 40, featured 40 original lithographs, and there'll be more, more to say about what a lithograph is in a minute, uh, from the State Museum and State Archives collections uh, associated with a fellow named T.M. Fowler. In addition to the original lithographs, which were framed and arranged by Regent, we also uh, included in the exhibit an interactive, which you see on the right-hand side, that allowed visitors to uh, uh, pull up scanned Fowler views, uh, again, close to 200 that were made of Pennsylvania cities and towns and explore them on, on their own, as you'll be able to do at the end of this presentation, I hope. Okay, I'd like to begin by uh, starting with answering the question, of who was T.M. Fowler and who were these bird's eye view makers that he was associated with? Uh, it was a very small fraternity, these bird's eye view makers. There were about 50 of them who were um, in operation primarily in the decades after the Civil War. Uh, the image I have up here shows um, uh, the man of the hour, T.M. Fowler, and he went by T.M. perhaps because his name was Thaddeus Mortimer, which did not quite trip off the tongue. So he, he, was, he was known as uh, uh, T.M. Fowler to his uh, associates and to those um, that uh, purchase his, his views. Uh, but he worked closely with a number of other view makers over the course of his career. Uh, these view makers, they were itinerant, meaning they traveled around, and effectively they divided up the United States into territories. The Bailey brothers were based in Ohio, but they sort of claimed much of the Midwest and parts of uh, New York and New England. Uh, John Reps, who was a uh, who was deceased, he uh, died actually this past year after a long career at Cornell University, where he taught urban planning and urban history. Uh, wrote the definitive monograph on the bird's eye views. And he, uh, according to his count, during the few decades after the Civil War, these bird's eye view makers generated about 4,500 views of about 2,400 American towns and cities. Uh, who was more specifically uh, T.M. Fowler? Well, he, we know he's a native of Massachusetts. We knew that he entered into the Civil War. Uh, he uh, volunteered for the Civil War and became a camp photographer, which may have been um, perhaps uh, an important uh, pre-training for his uh, career after the Civil War. Um, in the 18, late 1860s, he set out for the Midwest and started uh, apprenticing with a fellow named Albert Ruger, who ran a bird's eye view business uh, based in Chicago and had, had a, most of the upper Midwest. Uh, Fowler worked uh, with, with um, Ruger for a time before uh, lighting out for Pennsylvania in the 1870s uh, and eventually set in, settling in Morrisville, which is in Bucks County. 
So what's the big deal about T.M. Fowler? There are other guys doing this kind of work. Well, he's distinctive for a couple of different reasons. First of all, he had an extremely long career. Uh, he literally worked for over 50 years at bird's eye view making. As a result of that longevity um, and his own work ethic, frankly, he became the most prolific bird's eye view maker in American history. According to John Reps, uh, Fowler was responsible for uh, about 425 views. Um, now what's remarkable about that is that more than half, and John Reps counted 248 specifically, were done in Pennsylvania. Um, and this particular slide is kind of interesting because it shows Fowler as a young man and Fowler's first published view of Pennsylvania from 1878, it's of Allentown. In the lower right, we see a, 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 a photograph of Fowler now as a middle-aged man. And interestingly enough, his last published view of Pennsylvania, also ironically of Allentown. Um, most of Fowler's views um, were executed during an extremely prolific 20 year period from 1886 to 1906. The question then becomes, why did Fowler choose to play out his career largely, not, not, in, not solely in Pennsylvania? Um, I have to put up this rather boring uh, table and graph rather to show why in some ways it was simply a matter of supply and demand. Pennsylvania, after, um, after the Civil War, if we can go from about this point on the graph to about, let's say 1920, uh, was on an upward trajectory in terms of population. Um, this was expressed in a couple of different ways. You would have seen if you dropped into Pennsylvania during this, this period of time, existing towns and cities expanding in size, and also new towns forming overnight. These are the boom towns that we have all heard about probably in American history. And we think about the gold rush, we think about the oil boom, but there are other types of boom towns that were centered around perhaps more prosaic industries now, but industries like steel. This is a view of the homestead works of Carnegie Steel at about the time that T.M. Fowler was wandering around Pennsylvania. And we'll get back to his wanderings here in a little bit. Um, Pennsylvania became, of course, the number one manufacturer of steel. Most of it, not all of it, was concentrated in southwestern Pennsylvania in places like the Monongahela Valley. Of course, we also had another big industry, coal. And as if, if you know your Pennsylvania history, you know that we had two types of coal. We had anthracite, which is depicted in this, this particular view, and also bituminous coal. And what I think is interesting, and certainly what people, town view makers like uh, Fowler recognized, is that these industry, the towns were centered around the industries, and the people and the houses were kind of secondary, um, which I think is, uh, is an, just an interesting part of what was fueling town growth at that time. There's, other, there's another more practical reason for why Fowler set up shop in Pennsylvania and ended up having uh, such fertile ground to plow. And that's because Pennsylvania was endowed with an excellent infrastructure, especially if you're an itinerant artist and dependent on transportation to get to these places where you may be creating bird's eye views. This this view from 1893 shows the fact that you know Pennsylvania was literally honeycombed with rail lines uh, that made towns and cities accessible to the itinerant artist. And I think it's also I should note parenthetically that trains and railroads are featured in nearly every view, with one or two exceptions. The other interesting thing about Pennsylvania to note is the fact that. In addition to growing rapidly and increasing population to the point where Pennsylvania was the second largest state in the nation, uh, there was a lot of population density and settlement density. Why is that important? Well, it allowed a view maker like T.M. Fowler to economize on time and travel and maximize his output. 
This is a, a 1916 roadmap of Schuylkill County and shows the approximate um, location um, of four towns, Gerardville, um, Frackville, Shenandoah, and Mahanoy City. And if you can see here, they're very close to each other. And go figure, uh, T.M. Fowler sketched all four of these. The result of, of this kind of density com combined with growth and sheer numbers of municipalities that were going online in the, in the late 1800s is that uh, Fowler was able to work systematically by region to maximize production based on this proximity. Uh, parenthetically, his high point of production uh, was in 1893 when he generated uh, 25 views in a single year. That was an average of about 16 views. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I miswrote, miswrote that. It's, um, it was, uh, it was an impressive production. He was known among his peers for both an obsessive attention to detail um, and also uh, an impressive productivity. And the map, by the way, which again was assembled by John Rep, shows Fowler starting out in northeastern Pennsylvania, moving to, to uh, south central Pennsylvania, back up to northeastern Pennsylvania, hanging out there for a few years, dipping down to southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, going back to south central, then to northwestern, then to south or western Pennsylvania, and then finally kind of honing in on southwestern Pennsylvania, um, the, the steel region and the coal region there, which is where actually the vast majority of his views were of those communities. Um, the result, I think, of Fowler's concentration on Pennsylvania for us today is this statewide canvas. When views, viewed in its totality, Fowler's Pennsylvania views, I think, in, in a couple of different things, they did a couple of different things. Well, one, I think, things I think is interesting is that they document the diversity of the state's physiographic regions. And an, another theme in Pennsylvania, of course, is the impact of geography on economic development and settlement patterns. And these five examples are from five discrete regions, the Ridge and Valley region, which extended into Northeastern Pennsylvania, the, the coastal plain along the Great Lakes, um, the Allegheny Plateau in uh, uh, central and Western Pennsylvania, uh, the rolling uh, uh, farmland of southeastern Pennsylvania, and this is a river town in the Monongahela Valley near Pittsburgh. Um, so what exactly were these bird's eye views that Fowler and his cohort specialized in in the decades after the Civil War? Well, um, I'm showing this example because it, it's a bit of an origin story. Uh, bird's eye views were generated uh, that Fowler was generating evolved from earlier panoramic views. What I'm showing here is a uh, view of Harrisburg from 1855 in perspective. And what this does is it shows the city as it would have appeared to the naked eye if it was, you were looking at Harrisburg from the point of view of a particular bluff of a few hundred feet. Um, and you can see the buildings in the foreground. This is the old Hills Capitol for those of you who are familiar with our state capitol here in Pennsylvania. Um, you can see Capitol Park and you can see some houses along what would be present day State Street in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but of course, what's also interesting is that uh, the buildings and features in the background become less distinct as they vanish in the horizon. And let's see if I can do this and highlight that, you can see as we look back here, it's they're not quite as distinct, and that's because it's in one point perspective with a single vanishing point. We're accustomed to artwork looking like that, and these panoramic, early pan panoramic views conform to that. Now compare that to this 1881 bird's eye view of Harrisburg, you know, about, you know, almost 30 years later, Two things you note know, from a much wider perspective, um, as you can see here. Um, let me see if I can pull my laser pointer up. You know, we've got quite a bit of an expanse now covered by this map, and probably even more notable from a much higher angle, from about two or three thousand feet in the air. Uh, 
And you'll see, if you look closely at this, which we'll do again, it shows all of, all of the houses and streets and rail lines um, in, uh, in Harrisburg and the public buildings as they would have appeared to a bird flying overhead, hence the name bird's eye view. Now, what makes that a bird's eye view impor really important is because of this perspective, um, higher and wider, if you will, the features in the buildings in the background, and this is the background of the view, um, are in the same level, are at the same level of detail, and I'm just gonna zoom in just for a moment, and zoom back out if I can, as the buildings and features in the foreground. And you can see that in the foreground of this particular view of Harrisburg. So it's much more map-like than landscape painting-like in that regard, and it allows for a lot of detail. Um, this leads uh, led people to John, like John Reps, to a, to a question, how did they pull this off? There are a lot of myths surrounding the techniques of these bird's eye view makers. What was their trick? Did they have some kind of trick? And uh, John Reps uh, dismissed these when he was doing this early history of the bird's eye views back in the 1980s. It, it, it was not because of a, a, a pigeon that might have had a camera attached to its feet. It was not based on photographs that were gener generated by a man in a hot air balloon flying over the city. Um, instead, these were created by just a lot of hard work at the ground level, surveying and canvassing the community. The process began with Fowler arriving in town. He would have begun by drawing the town's street grid from the available maps and then placing them on a large sheet of paper. And it would have looked something like this. And you can see where he's drawn in the grid and he's sketched in a little bit of the background as well, uh, the topography. Um, that was the easy part. The hard part was then um, going up through the town and capturing all the building and the features. And to do that, the only way to do it, if you were a bird's eye view maker, was to walk every street with a sketchbook, drawing every building and feature that was could be observed. These sketches are not from T.M. Fowler's notebooks. They did not survive. It's from a colleague of his who worked in New England. But as you can see here, they've they've got the buildings sketched out and some notations. If you could read these, these are notes from the artist to the artist, noting important landscape features that he wanted to remember. Um, the, this is an important point to pause and say, you know, again, compared to that first 1855 panoramic view of Harrisburg, the bird's eye view uh, makers like T.M. Fowler were working in two point perspective, two vanishing points, that's important because it allowed buildings to be re rendered uh, in two dimensions. It was tampering with the rules of perspective, but in the service of allowing more details to be seen. And it worked especially well with buildings. The goal for Fowler and other bird's eye view makers was to draw features in sufficient detail so that they could be recognized by the townspeople. Uh, it was easy enough for Fowler to draw uh, landmarks like this bridge in Bell Vernon. Bell Vernon is a town in, in uh, Washington County near Pittsburgh. It's a glass making town. This is the, the, the bridge as it would have appeared to Fowler. This is how he rendered it in his drawings. But I think what's even more impressive if when you consider the fact that he did that for every building. It drew it in enough detail so it could be recognized. This is the Presbyterian Church in Bell Vernon, as it would have appeared when Fowler was creating this view. This is how he rendered it in, would have rendered it in his sketchbook. And if you look at the, the details, at the number of windows, for instance, you'll see that they correspond to the photograph. Impressive amount of detail. Now, that wasn't the end of this. Once he had the sketch in hand, in the evenings, we're presuming, he went back into his hotel room. Remember, he's a traveling artist. Uh, opened up his big plan, his big sketch, and then redrew this, any particular building, back onto his view in proper scale. Uh, this was a very labor intensive process, and it didn't end there. This is eventually what he would have ended up as his finished drawing. 
This view of Bell Vernon is one of only two or three original drawings that have survived because these rough drafts had no utility once the view was published. And that's the second part of this process. Once the view was completed, uh, bird's eye view makers would send the drawing off to the lithographer. Um, every drawing um, and lithography was uh, a crude way of reproduction. It was relatively cheap, relatively inexpensive. Every drawing though had to be copied um, recopied onto a limestone tablet that's being prepared here. And then there was an engraver who worked with a grease pen who recopied the image and then sent it over to this fellow who would ink it down and, and pass it through a press. And that's a very quick description of a very complicated process. But the magic of lithography is that it turned a rough draft that you see here into a completed print with sharpened details, vivid colors and lines. Uh, reps described lithographers as a silent partners with these bird's eye view makers who have gotten all the, claim, all the acclaim and um, who were able to make a very handsome living because uh, this, would, this whole enterprise would have gone nowhere without the ability to sell these prints back to the communities that were being de depicted. Um, and canvassers worked uh, alongside the view maker. In, in the case of uh, T.M. Fowler, he worked with a fellow named James Moyer, who was from Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, also a Civil War veteran, by the way. That's an uncanny uh, commonality to a lot of these fellows. They were all Civil War vets, it seems. Um, and then what about selling the views? Um, pretty lucrative business. This is a hypothetical balance sheet, as the title suggests, for the uh, a typical city view. M the income from typical sales, in this case, $1,000. Uh, total expenses, 520. Net profits, 530. Pretty lucrative. What could possibly have gone wrong? Technology. In 1920, Samuel Cooner, to take one example, took his first aerial photograph of Harrisburg. This happens to be South Harrisburg. Two years later, T.M. Fowler published his last view of Allentown. He died the same year. Thanks to new technologies, uh, maybe a, in, even with aerial photography, a, a decreased demand, um, a lot of these bird's eye views began to disappear. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s that they were rediscovered uh, by the, thanks to the efforts of individual collectors and the work of uh, repositories like the State Museum and the State Archive. Um, uh, let me slip back here just for a minute if I could. Um, we, uh, during the 1970s and 1980s, we were able to amass between the archives and the museum about 170 of these original lithographs. Um, and this is where I will kind of go quickly to uh, just summarize here what these do for us today. You know, on a macro level, they provide visual evidence of the relationship between towns and industries. These are literally snapshots in time uh, from, from the artist's perspective. The other way I like to describe these as are sort of the Google Maps of their day. Um, this is a view of Edwardsville as a very small town in, in the coal regions. And you can see here, you know, these, it really brings out the detail of these large mountains. Well, those mountains are actually calm banks or coal waste, and the town was built around them. Uh, again, a snapshot in time. Um, you can use these views as many uh, urban historians and, ur and uh, historical geographers have, have used them in order to understand city form, urban and industrial transportation system. This is Homestead. You see a coal barge moving down to Monongahela. You see a rail lines. Um, you can, if you look closely at any view, you can begin to see the elements of city building. This is a Ford city in Armstrong County. It was a glass town. It was also a model company town with all of the elements one would expect if you look closely at this bird's eye view, the, the factories near the river, um, the transportation system, specifically the rail lines, which also followed the water course. Um, stratified housing, uh, not only the churches and, and the homes of the middle class, but in this case, working class housing and probably company housing. And of course, 
public buildings like the local public school. Even amenities like city parks can be found in these views. And of course, the ever present um, influence of geography. This is a large bluff um, at the, what I guess would have been the, I'm not sure, western end of uh, Ford City that, that obviously penned in the housing uh, up to 7th Avenue there. Um, the, what I really find charming about bird's eye views is that sometimes the story that they reveal is self-evident and sometimes you have to look more closely to find out what the story is. This is a view of Montrose, which is a, a small community in northeastern Pennsylvania near the New York border in Susquehanna County. When I first looked at this, I saw a nice ordinary looking town from a macro view, you see houses and public buildings. It has a nice square. You can kind of, it's a New England style square. It looks, it's quaint. Um, but it really wasn't until I looked more closely at um, the key and each view provides a key that I noticed something quite interesting, which was the fact that this small town had two churches uh, that, that were of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination. And the location of these can be found on the map. Um, I, I consider this these kind of details divining rods for revealing a past, in this case, uh, Montrose's involvement in abolition and its subsequent destination for free African Americans uh, as as a really key part of what these bird's eye views can do for us today. Um, and there's also, and I will conclude with this, a kind of Where's Waldo element to these. Um, one of the first views I looked at when we began this project was the town of Pottsville, which I knew because it's in the coal regions, but most importantly, it's known today as the home of, quote, America's oldest brewery. And sure enough, if you look at this view of, of Pottsville, you will be able to find Yingling's Brewery nestled here among all of these buildings. Um, today, you can use these views to compare our earlier snapshots provided by TM Fowler to what's provided through Google Maps today. Another uh, a, a kind of intoxicating diversion if you are interested in how places change over time. The interactive, as my last word, um, is something that we had that was a popular part of the exhibit. We, we have brought it back to uh, uh, back it in action, so to speak, by bringing it online. And um, I'm actually probably going to use this as an opportunity to turn this back over to our host to talk a little bit more about the interactive and, um, and answer any questions that you might have. What you're going to do when you go into the website, um, and I'll put that in the chat box, a link to how to get to this website, you'll see that the towns here are on the side, all in alphabetical order, and then there's the county map. Which county you want to go to, Kurt? Uh, well, I, I was, you know, you can play around with any of these, of course. I just, yeah. one of the things I was interested in looking at recently is uh, if you go to Jefferson County, and pull up Punxsutawney. One of the, I was just, since we were, were kind of past Groundhog Day, but we're never really past Groundhog Day, are we? Um, I thought it was fun to, to see, you know, I wonder if Gobbler's Knob is depicted in, in Punxsutawney instead from what I was able to determine. And this is where it's kind of fun to go back and forth between Google, view, Google Maps and uh, the, the Fowler Views. Uh, I finally determined that Gobbler's Knob is not in this view. In fact, the depiction that Fowler created is from Gobbler's Knob or close mm -hmm. to it. So it's looking down on the, the, the town of, of Punxsutawney, which is, uh, has some cinematic fame, as we all know. Thank you, Bill Murray and Harold Ramis. Um, so it, but it shows some of the features of the town that were stylized in, in the movie. And I... I just think that's fun because you. the other thing, the last thing I, as I'm reminded about this is, well, TM Fowler was focused on buildings and natural features and making sales and making a lot of money by doing this. He peopled them. And I see that, Sherry, as you're moving around, one of the 
the other great charms is that he captured some degree of what life was like by what human activities were taking place in any given town at any given moment. Now, much of this was probably part of his imagination, but I'm sure he saw, as you are showing there, a ball field. Mm -hmm. And he, sh he showed horses and carriages. And if mm -hmm. you if you pan back out, there's a there's a there's a, a race track, and a lot of these towns had race tracks because it was the 1890s, and that was popular, you know, a popular pastime. So it's a there's a lot of incidental details that Fowler did not probably see himself as uh, trying to monetize every building he he captured. He thought was a possible way to monetize these drawings because someone who had an attachment to that building might buy a view from him mm -hmm. um but uh but i think these as a for us using these as historical resources um you can you know it's again they're they're shockingly accurate and they yeah right down to the level of detail you can see in the particular houses with the number of windows architectural styles etc so um they're they're, they're the the uses of these are are somewhat endless it really depends on the kind of a question you want to ask. And I'll finish with one one thing, just one tangent that I went off in. I, I actually went on a brewery tour of Pennsylvania with TM Fowler. And I was able to find about 27 breweries, brewery buildings in the views that we have um, online and in our collections at the State Archives and the State Museum. And what's interesting about when that is that you begin to see patterns. Uh, what what were what did brewery buildings look like? Where did they locate um, within towns? And 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 why why did Pennsylvania have so many breweries? And that's a that's a topic that Brad, who likes to talk about alcohol, uh, it was <laughs> and it did did so uh, in a very eloquent way when he was discussing distilleries. Uh, it, it tells you something about the the culture and um, social history of Pennsylvania, and one that you know still has. Um, still is with us today when you consider the fact that we have a pretty impressive physical infrastructure uh, that was built up during this, again, this immense growth spurt uh, that inspired T.M. Fowler and other, and even other bird's eye view makers to come to Pennsylvania. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Brad and Kurt now. Okay, we do have several questions, Kurt. And okay. uh, so for anyone out there, as you have questions, uh, that you can think of, please add them the, to the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them. Our first question, Kurt, how did Fowler know what towns had the right populations and industries to represent any bird's eye view? Yeah, that's a good question. There, there was certainly a sweet spot when it came to town size. And, and um, he, he, he off, and again, I am, I, we all work on the, uh, the shoulders of giants. Uh, John Reps is a giant in this field. He did every conceivable type of analysis of bird's eye views. And I think he determined that, you know, the appropriate size of a town would be, you know, between 5,000 and 20,000. Um, if it had an industry, he would, he would sell to anybody, but there was a certain size that was optimum because if they, if they were too small, it wasn't worth doing the work. One of the smallest views, for instance, which I thought was interesting in terms of population was Millersville in Lancaster County, which at the time was very small, uh, but it had a normal school. So that was probably a sufficient market for, for Fowler to create a view there. Um, he also did Pittsburgh and Scranton, two very large cities. Uh, I don't know how he pulled those off, uh, but that that seemed to really strain his ability. So I think he he tried to find medium sized cities that would again that sweet spot between doable because you could you could cap you could conceivably walk the town and canvas the town, and also then create enough views and enough of a market to then sell them. So that I I don't know if I precisely answered that question, but that he was just looking for anybody who would be willing to subscribe. And often the key was getting one town playing town pride off of 
of of you playing the town pride game to the extent that if there were a lot of it's interesting to follow the newspaper reports because um, a town would say, well, Frackville just got a view. Uh, so I think Shenandoah said he needs one now, too. You know, and that he that was that was part of his, I think, business plan uh, was was to uh, generate demand that way as well. Hmm. Very interesting. Next question. Are there any lithographs that depict towns that no longer exist? Um, I want to say that's a great question. And I want to say yes, but I cannot come up with the, the name right now. There's there's a there are one thing I can say, there are towns that I thought were not towns uh, any longer, but their names had changed. Um, and um, and I and again I, off the top of my head I cannot remember that but uh, what the name of that town was but that is a great question and yes there there are certainly places that have changed a lot their their, their name may may have changed and I that's something I can get back to them on. whoever's asked that question I I know I have some information about a few of those towns that did in fact either disappear or combined with another town so they've effectively disappeared. Thank you. Next question. On the website, it doesn't appear that he worked at all in Delaware County. Was this because another bird's eye view maker had already claimed that as his own turf? Precisely. Precisely. Uh, there's, if you look at the uh, interactive map, you'll see there's some, some blank spots. You know, um, that wasn't because there wasn't anything going on there typically. It's usually because it, precisely somebody else had already gotten there. I thought it was interesting when I first began this project that Fowler did no views of Harrisburg. Well, he didn't need to. Harrisburg had already sat for its portrait many times. So often larger, larger communities had already attracted bird's eye view makers. It where Fowler's business model was to get to places that typically had not had a view made for their particular community yet. And yes, and that does explain it. There's, if, if this individual is interested, I, I have a resource for, uh, for locating all town views for any Pennsylvania county. And I'm happy to share that outside of, the, of this, this particular program. Okay. Here we have a follow-up to the previous question about towns which no longer exist. Uh, someone asked if Centralia was a town that. Mm. No, no, that's not one that Fowler covered. He came close to it. And if you if you follow those, uh, if you go to our interactive and you click on the map, you'll see that he got close to that town, but it was not he was not there. He did not. That's not one. Now, having said that, there may be a bird's eye view of Centralia. And again, the same I would direct uh, this individual to the, that same resource and would be happy to to, to verify that um, af after this program. Okay. Did Fowler ever document a town more than once? Yes, he did that in a couple of occasions. Allentown was the one that I, I, I had mentioned. Um, there was a, uh, the other town, um, uh, it was in Western Pennsylvania and I'm gonna misspeak. I, I wanna say Manesson, uh, and it, but I, I need to verify that. So he did go back to a couple towns a couple of different times. Yes, and again, uh, what's interesting about it, I, Allentown's my favorite example of that, but uh, in the case of the other community, which is in Western Pennsylvania, it was interesting because you can, thanks to that note, subtle changes. And, and in the case of Allentown, dramatic changes because it was nearly 50 years between between the times he had been in, in Allentown the first time and the last time. Next question, a lot of great questions here. This is excellent. Next question, was Fowler trained as a draftman or a classical artist or what was his training? How did he- No, <laughs> he was self-taught. Now this is, I'm glad somebody asked this question because it's, it's fascinating. Um, Fowler's only had no training as far as we know. He worked, as I, I think I mentioned in the introduction, he worked as a, a photographer uh, during the Civil War, a camp photographer. And I think that just sort of introduced him to the concept of, of composition, visual composition. From there, we don't know precisely why he moved from photography back in time, essentially, to, 
um, the bird's eye view making, but he did apprentice with a bird's eye view maker. Um, having said that, wh what I thought was really interesting is that a, a, at least in a couple of instances, bird's eye view makers um, were were working in other kind of weirdly related trades. Like there were a number of them were who were um, carriage painters. Hmm. And and made and which is interesting that his partner James Moore was a carriage painter and so uh, art commercial art as I understand it in the 19th century was very broad if you had experience in one area you you kind of picked up the other part of it um, and but no he did none of them as I, as far as I could tell had any formal training they saw themselves as draftsmen uh, and they worked in a very spare style but they but they relied on each other to learn the technique and that this is classic craftsman's empire the the art and mystery of the trade was passed from one from one master craftsman to an apprentice uh, who then became a journeyman and then eventually struck out on his own uh, it was very much a it was not uh, conducive to fa factory production <laughs> really when you think about it we relied on the skills of art of self-trained but closely uh, um, supervised artisans we have a pair of questions that somewhat uh, go together. Is there a reason why Allentown was his first and last view? Was that by coincidence or by design? Um, I, T.M. Fowler had some bizarre connection with symmetry. <laughs> he, he had, yeah, that's all, the only way I can explain it. He worked for 50, you know, he, he began, his first published view was in Allentown and the last one was there. We He literally died. I think my understanding is he had slipped on a piece of ice after he completed the view, hit his head and died. Um, mm -hmm. Something along his line. But no, that that is just pure coincidence. But he seemed to uh, have this uncanny knack for uh, some kind of a symmetry in his life. And he, he liked to, he literally bookended things. And it was a really kind of just a neat little uh, just coincidence, as far as I can tell. Next question. You talked about how he'd, he'd go through the process of sketching, but one person is wondering, did he ever use photography to sort of supplement his, his work in creating the views? That is an excellent question. And um, I have not seen any evidence of that, but, you know, honestly, I'd had never even asked that question because he clearly was familiar with photography. Um, um, and that is something I would like to follow up on because I, that's a great question. And I did, I know that there were some tricks of the trade um, that he would have used, you know, available visual resources. Um, but uh, the point of, not only not just pride, but for practical reasons, he had to go in the field to sketch these so that he was sketching them at the same scale. So I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I'd have to follow up on that, but I, I had not even have not seen any mention of that. Uh, that he assumed the assumption is he drew everything uh, from uh, well, the in plain air, you know, through through visual observation of the real thing, while he canvassed the town with his sketchbook. Next question. Historically, what is the earliest example of this technique? Are there Renaissance examples of European cities rendered in the same way? Well, as I understand it from uh, that, what made bird's eye view different is, the, is that, again, that the two point perspective and I'm out of my element. I have, this is sort of an art, that's art history. But I, as I recall, uh, John Reps describing this is, uh, uh, if you recall that 1855 view of Harrisburg that I showed, that that's a panoramic view, which you would have seen earlier examples of that going back to the Renaissance. And it's the two point perspective that was, I think, made bird's eye views from Fowler's errors era different from earlier uh, or depictions and views of cities. Um, but it's, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, the other thing, but I think that's the answer is that it, it went from, it was more common to use one point perspective and the innovation was two point perspective. The other, of course, the other great innovation is the reproduction and through the lith lithography, which were, again, it looks laborious to me, but it was fast and cheap 
relatively speaking, given how 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 you know how especially labor intensive it would have been to create an engraving uh, and reproduce based on a, a, a particular work of any particular artwork, I should say. Um, but that's something I'd like. I'd, I would need to do a little bit more research on to see what the earliest example of this. According to John Reps, the first American bird's eye view dates to 1820 for, for, for some perspective on that. Uh, another question, getting back to the Centralia question, um, would the Gerardsville bird's eye view, I should say Gerardville bird's eye view be the closest he got to Centralia? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look at that. That's a, I, I, I have my I have my John Reps Bible, which for anyone who really wants to dive deep into this, um, we can provide that resource as well. This is a he wrote a uh, uh, he published a catalog of every uh, with the title and artist of every bird's eye view that he was able to locate that was ever created and published in the United States. It's a very thick book, but it has every it's organized by by state and within states alphabetically by city. So I, I, and I will be able to, I'd be happy to look that up to see how close you got. Well, great, uh, I, this has been awesome. Oh, go ahead, Brad, did you have a question? I actually have a question that I've been wondering. You mentioned that between the archives and the museum, there are about 170 preserved Fowlers in our collections. Are you aware of any instances where we know that Fowler rendered a community but we do not have a surviving yes of... yes john reps determined that fowler had created 248 pennsylvania views thus far when he completed his exhaustive work he had located 200 so there's there's some that are floating out there in fact there was one that had surfaced in the course of doing research for this um that was brought to our attention and i wish again i could remember the name of the town uh, but it was one that he identified as having been completed by fowler but for which there were no uh known examples hmm. no so so yes there are theoretically more to be discovered uh in at yard who knows yard sales uh you know um on ebay any other number of resources, but you know, so yes, there they have they are, there they are some out there that are still looking for were uh, a published lithographic print. Mm, that's fascinating. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, both Bradley and Kurt for joining us. Um, you know, if you do happen to have any other questions that comes up, um, I do see a couple where we're going to wrap up. I'll um, have Kurt, I'll email it to him and then send it out when I send out the recording uh, to anybody who's been registered to this list. So if you have any other questions, please pop it at uh, ctrimble at pa.gov. All right, so next week, um, we're going to be with the uh, director of the museum, uh, Beth Hager, and she's going to be talking about uh, our collections. Bradley, we are back with you on April 30th, right, for Pennsylvania's Last Mountain Lion. And then, of course, our next curator's choice um, will be highlights from the Games Changers. Brad, you want to tell us anything about that one? Sure. We're going to be joined by Dr. Cynthia Little, who is the guest curator of the Game Changers exhibit, an exhibit which looks at Pennsylvania women who made important contributions to our history. So she'll be talking about the exhibit and some of the, the Game Changers that are most interesting to her. Great. And of course, uh, we encourage you to sign up for all our lunch times that's in the chat box. Um, also, the chat box includes that link uh, that in, uh, talks about the reopening of the museum on April 30th and all the things that go along with that. So check that out. And everybody have a great weekend. And thanks so much. <laughs>